Task 1. Listen to a conversation between two students. Hey, Julie, you look upset. What's wrong? Hi, Ryan. Uh, it's nothing, really. Come on, spill it. Well, there's this guy in my organic chemistry class. He always wants to borrow my notes. It's really beginning to bug me. I keep telling him I need my notes to study, but he just won't leave me alone. If I were you, I'd tell your professor. Who is it? Linda Gordon. I had her last semester. She's great. I'd go see her right now. She needs to know that you're having a hard time studying because some guy's distracting you. She'll understand. She doesn't fool around either. Once you tell her what's happening, she'll set the guy straight. I was thinking about talking to Professor Gordon, but... But what? I don't want to get a bad name. You know, the student who's always running to the professor when something's wrong. You won't get a bad name. This is university, not high school. Look, here's another idea. Tell the guy he can borrow your notes, but on one condition. What? That he pay you. Pay me? For my notes? Why not? Organic chemistry is no easy course. Besides, if you're going to do all that work for this guy, then you should at least get paid, right? I'd ask for at least a hundred bucks. Task 2. Listen to a conversation between two students. 50%? Can you believe it? I thought living off campus would be more affordable. Boy, was I wrong. Didn't your landlord warn you that your rent was going up? No. He just showed up the day before the rent was due and said, By the way, your rent just went up 50%. Talk about a shock. So what are you going to do? I have no idea. You know, increasing the rent like that without proper notice can't be legal. If I were you, I'd talk to a lawyer, get some legal advice. Serious. There are laws that protect tenants from unscrupulous landlords. Aren't lawyers really expensive? Not if you go over to the law department. I bet you can find a third year who help you pro bono. Pro bono? What's that? It means no cost. Law students often give legal advice for free. It's a great way for them to practice law and learn how to deal with clients. Great idea. But in the meantime, I still have to pay my rent. I mean, I do like the place. You have a two-bedroom, right? Right. So why not get a roommate? That way you could share the costs, and you wouldn't have to move. I thought about that, but I like living on my own. Besides, I'm not sure how well I would get along with a roommate. Task 3. Listen to a conversation between two students. Hi, Greg. Do you have a minute? Sure, Anne. What's up? Professor Rogers just asked me to do a presentation. Lately, I've been helping people find jobs. It's this volunteer work I've been doing after school. Anyway, Professor Rogers wants me to give a presentation about it. Stupid me. I said yes. Why? What's wrong with giving a presentation? I'm terrified. I absolutely hate talking in front of a class. When do you have to present? In two weeks. Well, you could always tell Professor Rogers you're not comfortable doing it. I'm sure he'd understand. The only problem is you made a promise, and if you break it, it might not look too good later on, especially if you need Professor Rogers' recommendation or something. Yeah, I know. The more I think about doing it, the more scared I get. Look at me, I'm shaking. If you're not comfortable speaking in a classroom, why not change the location, you know, to a conference room? They're definitely less formal than a classroom. You can even have food and drinks. It's a great way to relax everybody. I've done it. Believe me, it works. Task 4. Listen to a conversation between two students. Hey, Tom. Congratulations. I hear you got a job doing research for Professor Wilson. Wow. Word really travels fast. But you know what? Professor Smith just asked me if I wanted to go to Arizona to do archaeological work on a Hopi Indian village. And get this. It's all expenses paid for the entire month of July. Can you believe it? So go. I want to, but the problem is I've already promised Professor Wilson I'd be his research assistant this summer. What's he want you to research? 
early American pottery. Not exactly Arizona, is it? Look, why don't you explain the situation to Professor Wilson? I'm sure he'll understand. He's a pretty cool guy. Besides, he can easily get another research assistant. Yeah, but he's famous. His name on my resume almost guarantees me a teaching position after graduation. Okay. Well, how about this? While you're in Arizona, do research for Professor Wilson online. Spend a few hours every day Googling early American pottery and then email him the results. Yeah, I never thought about that. That's definitely doable. Hey, do you want to work for Professor Wilson? And be stuck in a library all summer? I'll let you know, okay? Task 5 Listen to a conversation between two students. Are you sure? Yes. My professor plagiarized my essay. Not just a few words, but an entire page verbatim in his last research paper. This happened once before. A student accused her professor of plagiarism. And? The professor was fired. Great. Maybe I should just forget the whole thing. Maybe I should be flattered that a professor borrowed my work and just shut up about it. Marilyn, the man did not borrow your work. He stole it. If you'd done this, stolen his work, you would have been kicked out of school in two seconds. No, there's no way you can back down. You've got to confront the man. You need to take your essay and his paper to his office and tell him in no uncertain terms that what he did was wrong. But he's one of the most popular professors. He's a thief. He gave me an A plus for the essay he plagiarized. Look, if you don't want to confront him, then you've got to go to the dean. This is a serious breach of academic ethics. The sooner you confront the man, the better. Who knows how many other student essays he's plagiarized. But if I go to the dean, it'll be all over the school in no time. Yeah, well, I know what I'd do. Listen to a lecture in a zoology class. Animal behavior can be classified according to the time of day an animal is active. Animals, such as horses, elephants, and most birds, are said to be diurnal because they are active during the day and rest at night. Those animals active at dawn and dusk are said to be crepuscular. Beetles, skunks, and rabbits fall into this category. The third group are those animals that sleep during the day and are active at night. They are called nocturnal. A good example is the bat. Bats have highly developed eyesight, hearing, and smell. This helps them avoid predators and locate food. Being nocturnal also helps them avoid high temperatures during the day, especially in deserts, where temperatures can reach well over 100 degrees Fahrenheit. There are two types of bat. Microbats, or true bats, and megabats, also called fruit bats. Let's start with megabats. Size wise, megabats range from 2 to 16 inches in length. Megabats have extremely sensitive sight and smell. This helps them locate the flowers and fruit upon which they feed. It is while eating that megabats play an important role in the distribution of plants. Like bees, megabats serve as pollinators. When they lick nectar or eat flowers, their bodies become covered in pollen, which they, in turn, carry to other trees and plants, thereby acting as pollinators. In fact, many of the fruits and vegetables on our tables, such as bananas and peaches, would not be there if megabats did not pollinate plants and trees. Next are microbats. As the name implies, microbats are quite small, about the size of a mouse. To find food, microbats use echolocation, high-frequency sounds they bounce off insects. The most common microbat is the vesper or evening bat. Like megabats, microbats play an important role in the environment. The average vesper bat, for example, can eat 1,000 mosquitoes in one night. By doing so, they control the mosquito population.
Task 1. Listen to a lecture in a law class. There are two types of defamation. The first is slander. Slander is a false statement which is spoken to another person other than the subject. A spoken statement may be made in person or through media, such as television or radio. A statement is slanderous if it is heard and if, as a result of hearing it, the listener has a negative impression of the subject. The second type of defamation is libel. Libel is a false statement which is written about someone in a book, a newspaper, or some other written media. It is libelous if it casts a negative light on the subject and is false. In this case, the plaintiff must prove that the statement is false in order to win a claim of defamation. In addition, the statement must be a fact, not simply the writer's opinion. Let's take a look at an example of libel. Let's say you're a journalist and you don't like Susie the movie star. In an article, you claim that Susie paid a bribe to adopt an African baby. You know it isn't true, but you wrote it just to make Susie look bad. Your article was read by millions and by Susie. As a result, Susie sues you and your publisher for defamation of character. You, the defendant, argue that the information in your article is true and not just your opinion. Susie, however, claims that the information is false and that it has damaged her reputation. How? Susie was supposed to get a big commercial endorsement from the baby perfume company, but Baby Perfume broke the contract when it read your article. At this point, Susie must prove that the information in your article is false. If she proves that you did indeed lie, then she wins her case and you suffer the consequences. However, if Susie fails to prove that you lied, she loses the case. Task 2 Listen to a lecture in a geology class. Earthquakes occur because the Earth's surface, instead of being one big piece, is actually divided into parts called tectonic plates. Where two plates meet is called a fault line. When two of these plates move or collide along a fault line, a shock wave occurs. These shock waves are called seismic waves. They are so powerful they can change the surface of the earth as well as destroy buildings, cause avalanches, and create giant sea waves called tsunamis. Earthquakes are measured by a seismograph. Seismographs measure the duration and the intensity of an earthquake. An earthquake's intensity is measured on a scale called the Richter scale. An earthquake that measures 4 on the Richter scale is considered a minor earthquake, whereas an 8 is considered great and with catastrophic potential. There are two basic types of earthquake. The first type is the strike slip. A strike slip earthquake occurs when one tectonic plate shifts horizontally against a second stationary plate. An example of a strike-slip earthquake was the Great San Francisco Earthquake of 1908. It occurred before seismography was developed. However, geologists estimate it registered 7.9 on the Richter scale, with the shock waves felt as far away as Los Angeles. Over 3,000 people died, most in the fires that burned out of control. Next is the dip-slip earthquake. A dip-slip earthquake occurs when one tectonic plate shifts vertically along a fault line. A recent example of a dip-slip earthquake was the Indian Ocean earthquake in December 2004. It lasted almost 10 minutes and registered 9.3 on the Richter scale, making it the second largest earthquake ever recorded. 
The fault line was 1,200 miles long under the Indian Ocean. Of that length, an estimated 994 miles rose more than 50 feet. So great was the shock that the entire earth shook for almost half a second. Tragically, over 230,000 people died. Task 3 Listen to a lecture in a women's studies class. In women, estrogen regulates the development of female sexual characteristics and reproduction. As a woman reaches middle age, around age 45, the estrogen level decreases. Indications of decreased estrogen are hot flashes, mood swings, and weak or broken bones due to a loss of bone mass. It wasn't until the early 1960s that author Robert Wilson, in his book Feminine Forever, recommended that women could stop the aging process by taking estrogen pills. Suddenly, women started taking estrogen and were feeling much better for it. However, in the early 1970s, a rise in uterine cancer was connected to an increase in estrogen usage. So, women stopped taking estrogen almost overnight. In the late 1970s, doctors did an about face and said that it was okay to take estrogen combined with another hormone, progestin. By the 1990s, doctors were so enthusiastic about the estrogen progestin combination that they were telling women that hormone replacement therapy, HRT for short, Was the solution to stopping heart attacks. In short, HRT was a lifesaver. By 2000, almost 6 million women in the United States were taking some form of HRT. That, then, is a brief history of estrogen use in America. But is the news all good? No. A lot of research has been done on estrogen. The most striking of which was a report by the Women's Health Initiative. In July 2002, the Women's Health Initiative announced the preliminary results of their HRT research. Of the 16,000 women they were studying, HRT had increased the risk of heart attack by 29%, breast cancer by 24%. Blood clots by 100% and stroke by 41%. The evidence was clear. Hormone replacement therapy was life threatening. Because of these results, the Women's Health Initiative stopped their research. Numerous other studies have since supported the findings of the Women's Health Initiative. Task 4. Listen to a lecture in an environmental studies class. Two factors determine whether a plant or an animal is invasive. The first is the species based mechanism. All species, whether invasive or not, compete to survive. However, invasive species demonstrate specific traits that help them outcompete native species. Those traits are the ability to reproduce faster, rapid growth, a high dispersal rate, and an ability to withstand environmental conditions. Next is the ecosystem based mechanism. Within every ecosystem, certain plants and animals fill specific niches. This creates a balance. However, when that balance is disrupted, Such as a decrease in soil quality, invasive species take advantage of this imbalance and start to appear. Some invasive species simply move into a new ecosystem because there is simply space to grow and thrive. An example is the feral hog, or wild pig, in the southern United States. In 1539, Pigs first arrived in America with the Spanish explorer Hernando de Soto. Since then, Americans have kept pigs, many of which escaped 
and roamed freely. The problem suddenly became serious at the beginning of the 20th century when pig hunters introduced European wild boars. Some European boars escaped and bred with wild American pigs. The result was the feral hog, an invasive species whose numbers are growing at an alarming rate. Feral hogs readily adapt to any new environment. They fear nothing, not even humans. Because they dig for food, they destroy native habitat and farmers' crops. Worse, feral hogs are prodigious breeders. A population can double in size in four months. The problem is most acute in Texas, with over two million feral hogs. Feral hogs have recently been sighted in Wisconsin and Canada. To date, the largest feral hog ever recorded was Hogzilla, shot in Georgia in 2004. Hogzilla was over seven feet long and weighed over 800 pounds. Listen to a lecture in a business class. Income tax is a tax on income earned by an individual or a business, such as a company, a partnership, or an organization. This tax is imposed on the net income of the taxpayer. Net income is the result of all earned income reduced by deductions, which are the costs associated with earning the income. A tax on a transaction is called a sales tax. Paid by the purchaser, this tax is a percentage of the price of the item purchased. Sales tax can also be a tax on a service, such as having your hair cut or buying a new car. The government can also impose a tax on property. The property may be real property, such as a house or land, or personal property, such as a car or a boat. Now, if you're like most Americans, you hate paying taxes, especially income tax. Why do Americans hate paying income tax? For a variety of reasons. First, many Americans don't pay income tax because the income tax form is simply too complicated. Many fail to understand what all those lines and instructions mean. As a result, they become frustrated and refuse to pay. Next, many believe that income tax unfairly targets the middle class. A good example is Warren Buffett. Buffett, one of the richest men in the world, pays an average of 17% income tax thanks to his army of lawyers and accountants, while his secretary pays 30%. Finally, Americans hate paying income tax because they think it's a tax on success. Why, many Americans wonder, if I am successful, should I have to hand over all my hard-won cash to Uncle Sam and get little or nothing in return? Actually, you do get something in return. You get roads, law enforcement, and social services, all of which are paid by tax dollars.